I think that Adam Schiff does a great job of, uh, uh, I think his demeanor is, is, I think it's very good. Uh, no wonder Trump hates him so much. But, boy, he, he put on a great presentation. All And at, at 1 o'clock this morning, and I'll get to that a little bit later, where they were asking, well, if there's, a, this, if there's an issue where we need to have a decision made, an arbitrator, let the judge. And you know the Republicans said, hell no, we ain't going to let Judge Roberts make no decision. We ain't going to let him do no-. I said, my God. That was the last. Anyway, Mr. Engineer, roll clip number four. Let me begin by summarizing why. Last week, we came before you to present the articles of impeachment against the President of the United States for only the third time in our history. Those articles charge President Donald John Trump with abuse of power and obstruction of Congress. The misconduct set out in those articles is the most serious ever charged against a president. The first article, abuse of power, charges the president with soliciting a foreign power to help him cheat in the next election. Moreover, it alleges, and we will prove, that he sought to coerce Ukraine into helping him cheat by withholding official acts, two official acts, a meeting that the new president of Ukraine desperately sought with President Trump at the White House to show the world and the Russians in particular that the Ukrainian president had a good relationship with his most important patron, the president of the United States. And even more perniciously, President Trump illegally withheld almost $400 million in taxpayer-funded military assistance to Ukraine, a nation at war with our Russian adversary, to compel Ukraine to help him cheat in the election. Astonishingly, the president's trial brief filed yesterday contends that even if this conduct is proved, that there is nothing that the House or this Senate may do about it. It is the president's apparent belief that under Article 2, he can do anything he wants, no matter how corrupt, outfitted in gaudy legal clothing. And yet, when the founders wrote the impeachment clause, they had precisely this type of misconduct in mind. Conduct that abuses the power of his office for personal benefit, that undermines our national security, that invites foreign interference in our democratic process of an election. It is the trifecta of constitutional misconduct justifying impeachment. In Article 2, the president is charged with other misconduct that would likewise have alarmed the founders. The full, complete, and absolute obstruction of a co-equal branch of government, the Congress, during the course of its impeachment investigation into the president's own misconduct. This is every bit as destructive of our constitutional order as the misconduct charged in the first article. If a president can obstruct his own investigation, if he can effectively nullify a power the Constitution gives solely to Congress, indeed the ultimate power, the ultimate power the Constitution gives to prevent presidential misconduct, then the president places himself beyond accountability, above the law, cannot be indicted, cannot be impeached. It makes him a monarch, the very evil against which our Constitution and the balance of powers it carefully laid out was designed to guard against. Shortly, the trial on these charges will begin, and when it has concluded, you'll be asked to make several determinations. Did the House prove that the President abused his power by seeking to coerce a foreign nation to help him cheat in the next election? And did he obstruct the Congress in its investigation into his own misconduct by ordering his agencies and officers to cooperate, refuse to cooperate in any way, to refuse to testify, to refuse to answer subpoenas for documents and through every other means? And if the House has proved its case, and we believe the evidence will not be seriously contested, you will have to answer at least one other critical question. Does the commission of these high crimes and misdemeanors require the conviction and removal of the president? We believe that it does, and that the Constitution requires that it be so, or the power of impeachment must be deemed a relic or a casualty to partisan times, and the American people left unprotected against a president who would abuse his power for the very purpose of corrupting the only other method of accountability, our elections themselves. 
And so you will vote to find the president guilty or not guilty, to find his conduct impeachable or not impeachable. But I would submit to you, these are not the most important decisions you will make. How can that be? How can any decision you will make be more important than guilt or innocence than removing the president or not removing the president? I believe the most important decision in this case is the one you will make today. The most important question is the question you must answer today. Will the president and the American people get a fair trial? Will there be a fair trial? I submit that this is an even more important question than how you vote on guilt or innocence because whether we have a fair trial will determine whether you have a basis to render a fair and impartial verdict. It is foundational. The structure upon which every other decision you will make must rest. If you only get to see part of the evidence, if you only allow one side or the other a chance to present their full case, your verdict will be predetermined by the bias in the proceeding. If the defendant is not allowed to introduce evidence of his innocence, it's not a fair trial. So too for the prosecution. If the House cannot call witnesses or introduce documents and evidence, it's not a fair trial. It's not really a trial at all. Americans all over the country are watching us right now. And imagine they're on grand jury or they're on jury duty. Imagine that the judge walks into that courtroom and says that she's been talking to the defendant. And at the defendant's request, the judge has agreed not to let the prosecution call any witnesses or introduce any documents. The judge and the defendant have agreed that the prosecutor may only read to the jury the dry transcripts of the grand jury proceedings. That's it. Has anyone on jury duty in this country ever heard a judge describe such a proceeding and call it a fair trial? Of course not. That's not a fair trial. It's a mockery of a trial. I think that um, this, this statement regarding the most important decision you will make will be not whether or not Trump is uh, guilty and removed or not guilty and sustained, but whether you will let this be a fair trial was a powerful, powerful, very powerful example. You know, I, I do a lot of speaking, public speaking. I've been doing so for 37 years. I do more public speaking now than I've ever done in all the years of my life. <clears throat> I'm, as you know, on the air several hours per day. I preach four and five hours on Saturday. So I do a lot of public speaking. And I can tell you, it's an extraordinarily difficult profession and craft uh, to perfect uh, public speaking. It just because there's just so many things that need to happen. First of all, your message needs to be one that is compelling. And when you listen to Adam Schiff and the way, I don't know whether a speechwriter wrote this for him or whether he sat down with the facts and organized it in the, in the scale and way he did it, but it was, it was Pulitzer level writing. And then, of course, that's one part of public speaking in terms of your message, but the other is your delivery, your ability to have the nuances of the breathing, the nuances of the inflections of when to emphasize a word and when to de-emphasize an idea or when to just pause and let an idea sink in. Um, all of that, for instance, when he said that uh, all America's watching us, he looks up at the camera, which is to say, I acknowledge you out there that are not in this in the Senate well here. And, you know, his delivery and demeanor is very stained in as much as that he doesn't raise his voice. He doesn't uh, he doesn't accent the, 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 the things that he wants with a stronger demeanor, which a lot of people do. And that is not to say that you can't do that. Um, Tribulation Trump's an excellent speaker. I'll give him that. Uh, he's an excellent communicator, great messenger. Uh, but Adam Schiff is just stellar. I mean, th this is going to go down as perhaps, I mean, I, I, over the weekend, you know, there was a Dr. Martin Luther King celebration and one of the 
television uh, analysis compared Dr. King's speech to Abraham Lincoln's speech when Abraham Lincoln said in this great war that we're contesting in, we have brothers against brothers. They both pray to the same God. They still believe the same God will deliver them from each other, uh, which was an incredible message beyond the Gettysburg Address from Abraham Lincoln. And then, of course, there was Dr. King at the, just in his 30s with his with his Baptist sing-song way of delivery. Um, and, uh, and even at the Stockholm event where Dr. King said that, um, while receiving a Nobel Prize for Peace, that right, temporarily defeated, is, st is even stronger, it's still stronger than wrong, uh, uh, violently and viciously uh, winning. Uh, very powerful speeches, and King was good. But I have to tell you, I believe that Adam Schiff's speech throughout the thir 13 hours will be listed uh, by the historians as some of the great speeches from the House or from the Senate. And then he continues to use, and has coined a phrase that I picked up on some time ago, the word cheat. You know, cheat. I mean, you know, I think most people in public life, you can call them a whole lot of things, liars, thieves, even adulterers, but to call you a cheat, that he cheats in the election, that he cheats, that he cheats, is a very painful, very powerfully painful word that Schiff has coined to use against Trump. And I, I think it's extraordinary in terms of, um, of, uh, of his bringing down tribulation Trump. And then the other thing is that the, the, uh, the examples that he gave of a judge walking into the courtroom and said, I just con uh, conferred with the defendant and we're not going to let any witnesses or documents be brought forward is preposterous. So I don't know who, whether he writes his speeches himself or whether he, uh, you know, he coordinates with others to write speeches. But I thought it was a great presentation uh, by Adam Schiff, and I think it's going to carry the day. Um, I'm going to watch again today. This is day number two. Uh, probably another 13 hours of the wee hours of the morning. Um, and I may not even show up tomorrow uh, to do the broadcast because I'll probably be sleeping like a bear after trying to stay to catch all of these events because you don't want to miss you know, a, 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 an explosive moment such as what happened last night when Judge Roberts had to uh, scold both of the uh, uh, attorneys, uh, the managers and the uh, attorneys for the president. In fact, let's bring that up, Mr. Engineer. That's clip number one where Roberts uh, had to put in, first time he did anything of note within the trial. It's clip number one. So far, I'm sad to say, I see a lot of senators voting for a cover-up, voting to deny witnesses, an absolutely indefensible vote, obviously a treacherous vote, a, tr a, vo a vote against an honest consideration of the evidence of the, against the president, a vote against an honest trial, a vote against the United States. Mr. Nadler came up here and made false allegations against our team. He made false allegations against all of you. He accused you of a cover-up. He's been making false allegations against the president. The only one who should be embarrassed, Mr. Nadler, is you for the way you've addressed this body. I think it is appropriate at this point for me to admonish uh, both the House managers and the President's counsel in equal terms uh, to remember that they are addressing the world's greatest deliberative body. One reason it has earned that title is because its members avoid speaking in a manner and using language that is not conducive to civil discourse. Um, in the 1905 Swain trial, a senator objected when one of the managers used the word pettifogging. And the presiding officer said the word ought not to have been used. I don't think we need to aspire to that highest standard, but I do think those addressing the Senate should remember where they are. 
I'm going to have more from Judge Roberts. And uh, the last vote of the House last night at 115 was whether or not Judge Roberts would be the arbitrator if there was the, a witness that was called um, and there was some sort of wrangling over uh, whether or not that person should be called or should be put in on the, the, on the witness stand. And the Republicans voted no, Judge Roberts should not be the one who was the final arbitrator. I'll have more to say about him in a segment coming up. But I, I want you to hear a little bit more about our school and about our help of children. Uh, and I want you to remember helping us as well uh, and the great work we're doing up here in Harlem, New York City. I'm not a hater and uh, I've not changed. I'm not a liberal. I'm not a Democrat. I'm not a member of the Black Panther Party, Civil Rights or Black Lives Matter. I don't support Obama or Al Sharpton. But I also don't support the white racist supremacist and tribulation Trump and the vile attempt that they're trying to put forward to save the demographics politically and economically of a dwindling white race, a Jafriff race, I should say. I'm just telling the truth as I always did. I was loved when I told it on Obama, but it seems now that it's received differently that I'm telling it on their brother. This is a bit of a news blog we do, looking at spiritual wickedness in high places for the most part, making uh, some observations about it and giving people a biblical foundation to the way of interpreting rather than have uh, uh, Sean Hannity or Laura Ingram or Janine Pirro or Anderson Cooper or Rachel Maydow or Don Lemon, uh, Rush Limbaugh interpret what's going on in the world. You come to me and I'll tell you based on what the word of God says. They'll just give you their worldly sinful view. But the man will tell you what God has said whether to say yea or nay, whether to go or to stay. You'll be like led by the word of Almighty God. Come to the Manning Report on a daily basis to interpret the spiritual wickedness in high places because there's plenty of it that's going on. And so I am he, I'm the Lord, sir, James David Righteous Rebel Manning. And I'm here to serve you with news and information.